Well, quite a bit to talk about on and off the field. Uh, Jose Cisnero put on waivers. We'll talk about that. The Tigers made a waiver claim and filled their 40-man roster spot with someone from outside the organization. We'll talk about that. We got September call-ups right around the corner. And then we also have a baseball game to discuss. And that's the extent of what I want to talk about with the game. But we'll go more in-depth all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers. Your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Wednesday, August 30th. 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Be sure to check out the Tigers home radio broadcast, as always, on the Sirius XM app. Just search Detroit Tigers. The next thing you know, anytime, anywhere, you you can be listening to the Tigers home radio broadcast as long as they're playing a game. Uh, the Tigers did play a game on Tuesday evening. They lost to the Bronx Bombers by a score of 4-2. to two. A lot of same story, different day with the, with the product on the field. A lot. Um, this offense has been dreadful, this homestand. And, like, it's so just odd that, like, th- this team had the most – it's not odd in the sense that, like, I ever thought they were good. If you listen every day, you're very aware. I've been calling this a bottom – uh, a, a bottom tier offense in baseball all season, even when they were hot. But um, they they hit more home runs than they have on any road stand in like 15, almost 20 years. And then they just come home and they look absolutely lifeless. And like the warning signs were there. We talked about the warning signs. We talked about this yesterday. We talked about this last week. We we'll have to go down that rabbit hole again necessarily, but – Like, this team does not produce runs. So when they were hitting a bunch of homers, they were able to overcome that. And that's what teams that hit a lot of homers, that's why teams build their their offense that way. Well, we're we're not going to get a few timely hits in a row. We're really bad with runners in scoring position. We can't produce runs. We don't have table setters. Home run solves all. The problem is the Tigers are not a home run hitting team. This is one of the worst slugging percentages in all of baseball as a team. It has been all year, even with the uptick in August. And now we're playing at home, which we're now, what, 11 games under 500 at home? 10 or at least 10, 10 or 11 under 500 at home on the year. Only three under, I believe, two or three under 500 on the road. This team is just dreadful at home. And if if Green, Torque, and Carpenter are not putting up runs, you are in big trouble because the other six dudes in this lineup are not consistent, everyday run producers. And so you find yourself here. And this is exactly why this team was never, like, really in contention. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's because they this is still... The offense, this is still what it is. And and this is not so, like, you know, the, the future of the franchise. I, I, I don't take back like anything I said about like the core being here. I still b- believe all that. This one game in August did not change like my big picture outlook on this team. But like it's it's times like this that you realize there's still a ways to go. Like we had the fun couple of weeks, right, where you went, hey, look, the core is here. Look, it, there's like some good happening here. We have we have a foundation. And then there's the reality checks like this. And we're like, we have, you know, a foundation maybe, but it's it's not a foundation that's taking place this year or maybe even next year. And taking place is the right way to put it. A foundation that is able to be built around to be like a legit contender in the immediate future. There is still so many holes in this roster. And we'll talk about the roster a little bit at the end of the show as well, but like, Man, we had this conversation last winter, too. I mean, I think we're in the same boat. We're like, you could make an argument to getting rid of, like, more than half of this 40-man roster. You really could. Like, pretty easily, I think, for a lot of those guys as well. 
So it's great that we have a foundation and we have the people that we know are going to be here long term. And we have players like Carpenter, right, that have come out of the woodworks and have proven to be long term pieces. We have long term pieces. There was one point just a couple of years ago when we didn't even have that. OK, so I'm, I'm very happy that that we have gotten and we have taken a step forward this year. This is not the same as last season. But. Look at what the offense has done the last week. It's dreadful. It's awful. It's abysmal. It's pathetic. Whatever adjective you want to use. Let's talk about some off the field news that happened in this. Well, I was going to say in this game. That doesn't make sense. On this day, on Tuesday, sure, um, Jose Cisnero was put on waivers. I sent out a tweet that was worded absolutely horrifically, and I feel bad about it because it, I think it led people like the wrong way. It was worded just so unbelievably poorly. Um, I, I clearly did not proofread. And so uh, I made it sound like Jose Cisnero was like off this baseball team. He is on waivers. He is not off this baseball team. The recoverable waivers – um, if he clears, which they have teams have until Thursday to do, then the Tigers will be in a position where they can do a few different things with him. I would be very surprised if like he he's still he was in the dugout or in the bullpen rather today. Like he's still on the team, but he's on waivers. And if a team picks him up, then there you go. He's just on that team then. And unless the Tigers yank it back, but I can't imagine they would. Um, and, and he's just on that team and whatever. If he clears and he passes, then uh, the Tigers have the flexibility to do a few different things. Um, I would imagine that they would release him. I, I I don't know why they would put him on waivers just to hold on to him if he cleared. That doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, so I would imagine that if if he clears waivers, that the Tigers will re- release him. So it, by uh, and Scott Harris is a wild card. Who knows? He he has proven. To, we'll talk about that in a second as well. He's proven to be a complete wild card. Um, with, with this kind of stuff. So maybe not, but I don't, I genuinely don't understand why he wouldn't. So uh, we can presume here, Jose Cisneros, the era of him on the Tigers is not over at the time that you're listening to this, but by Thursday, it almost assuredly will be by the weekend series on Friday. So uh, that's where he stands currently. Um, the, the, I mean, the Angels put half their team on waivers, but this is a very common waiver day. Uh, Tuesday, uh, a few days before September call-ups as teams are trying to get their roster set for call-ups. Very common to do this at the very end of August. So um, that's why you saw so much waiver activity. We'll see who gets claimed and who doesn't. Um, uh, Cisnero, it wouldn't shock me if uh, Jose Cisnero was picked up by a a, a team. Um, But, I mean, he hasn't been good at all in the last month. So it certainly wouldn't be surprising if he passed either. Um, the Tigers did make a waiver claim and they filled their 40 man roster spot that was open that we've talked about the last two days. How uh, they filled that with a gentleman by the name of Bennett Sousa. Uh, he is a left handed pitcher that is 28 years old. He'll be 29 next season, but it will be 28 for the remainder of this year. Uh, in his major league career, he has appeared in 27 games and has an ERA of nine. Uh, That is 25 games for the White Sox last year and two games for the Brewers this year. Had an 8-4-1 ERA in those 25 games last year. Uh, I mean, his whip is like 1.8 at the Major League level. In AAA, his ERA is a whole heck of a lot lower. He actually has decent strikeout numbers in AAA, um, but his walk numbers are high pretty much everywhere, and his strikeout numbers in the majors have been unbelievably low. It has not translated He is a lefty. He's a two-pitch pitcher. He's a reliever. Uh, He essentially only throws fastballs and sliders, which as a lefty, you can more than pull off a 94-mile-an-hour fastball, uh, mid-upper-ish 80 slider. That's the profile. Um, As far as, like, the move itself goes, I'm I'm pretty tired of this. Uh, And I'm I'm not not trying to, to, like, get – you know, too worked up about a waiver claim in August. Um, but what's the point of this? I, I mean, genuinely, like what, what is, I, I understand that Toledo's bullpen has not been good. And if they're doing this just to bolster the mud hens bullpen the rest of the year and give them a, an effective lefty, then so be it, you know, organizational depth is very important, but I mean, golly, I, I, I just, 
<laughs> player development is its own entity. You can't just call people up just because like the fans want to, or because the major league product sucks or is boring. I understand all of that. Um, but at least, I don't know. I, I just, I don't see this guy's going to be a pitcher for the Toledo mud hens for a month. And that's going to be the extent of this. And look, Jose Cisnero could free up another 40-man spot here in a second. There's still flexibility here. You can still get rid of Zach Short if he got DFA'd. Would people cry about it? No. Like, there, there's there's so many players on this roster that you could DFA and, and you could make arguments is, is justified. Um, so, like, they have the flexibility to still do stuff. It's just, I who needs another, like, guy who's just, like, never going to be a long-term piece for this major league product. This dude's going to be in this organization for a month and he's probably never going to step foot in Comerica park. I, I just, I'm not sure why that's a priority. That's all. Okay. Let's move on. Let's talk about this ball game. Uh, we'll talk about the offense, which was just so stellar. Let again, uh, we'll talk about that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at LinkedIn sales solution. We haven't talked about our friends over at LinkedIn in a while. If you're struggling with close deals, cold outreach is wasting the time of both the buyer and the seller at every stage, especially when sellers are using shallow and outdated data. Your organization can overcome these challenges with technology that translates comprehensive, high-quality buyer data into real-time insights. These deeper insights empower sales reps and teams to adopt the habits of top performers, which leads to better outcomes like more pipeline, higher win rates, in larger deals. We call this deep sales and we've been and we have built the first deep sales platform with the next generation of LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Right now you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator at, and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com/lockedon. That's linkedin.com/lockedon for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn tell LinkedIn Sales Navigator Help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on to get started. All right, everybody. Welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back tomorrow recapping game three against the New York Yankees. We'll preview that a little bit at the end of the show. Um, so, this game was uh, offensively horrific yet again. They got shut out through eight against Michael King and then scored two runs in the ninth. And in the same breath that I understand it, we've talked a lot about how this team does come back, not even come back. They do score runs in the ninth. <laughs> okay. And they have a lot of comebacks that have fallen short throughout the season. Um, I, I think that that is, again, a, a sign of, I, I'm not saying this game is a sign of progress, but I, I do appreciate that fact. And if they had more talent, maybe they could get over the edge and these comebacks could actually be successful comebacks. And they could teeter, you know, over the edge and, and get us on the side of winning these ball games and not just scoring runs in the ninth for no reason. Like they do so, so often. Um, but I, it's just a fine line. It's a very fine line of like, I'm not mad about it. I'm obviously not upset that this team is is showing life and had the winning run at the plate in the ninth inning. That's a good sign. Uh, that that's more than you know last year's team showed. But it's 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 just a frustrating step in development. It's a frustrating spot to be at. Like you'd almost just rather all in or all out it. But it it is a it is a step nonetheless, no matter how small. Um, but yeah, this offense was dreadful. Absolutely dreadful yet again. The Yankees offense wasn't even good in this game. We'll talk about Tarek Skubal after this, but like th this was this was not good. Um, Riley Green has reverted back to April Riley Green in the sense that every single ball he puts in play is a ground ball to the second baseman. Every single one. I mean, my goodness, he went 0 for 4 in this game. Did he have four outs to second base? He had at least three because I can I can think of the three off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember what the fourth was. But 
that was an April problem. The dude had a 60% ground ball rate. And we talked about, we documented in detail back in April, right? How frustrating that was and what adjustments he needed to make. And then he did. And he stopped doing it in May. And his OPS was 1,000. And he stopped doing it. And, and then he got hurt. And he came back from the injury. And he still wasn't really doing it. And now, whether it's because of a lingering injury, whether it's just because of fatigue, whether it's an adjustment that he made and needs to like make another one to get rid of it again, I, I don't have the answer. But golly, we're right back to it. We are right back to it. Um, and 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 I don't, I don't, I worry about a lot of things within this organization. I worry about a lot of players within this organization. Pretty much every single pitcher we have, I worry about consistently. Pretty much every hitter we have, I worry about. Uh, I, I still, obviously, we, we talk about our concerns with Torkelson. We, we talk about our concerns with, with Scott Harris and, you know, the moves that he makes. We, we're, we're still concerned about a lot. Um, I am not concerned about Riley Green making an adjustment and fixing this again. I, I'm not. And that doesn't make it any less frustrating. That doesn't make it something that I won't bring up every single show when he keeps grinding out the second base. That won't mean that that doesn't mean I won't get mad about it. But as far as long term, I still fully expect him to make the adjustment. <clears throat> excuse me, make the adjustment just like he did earlier in the season and uh, and get out of this. But it, it is definitely an issue again. The last week he has been grounding out everything to second base again. Um, Spencer Torkelson, 0 for three with a walk, went on a crazy hot streak. And we're right back here. We're right back here. And that that's, again, a very frustrating spot to be at. He has objectively improved from last year. Uh, that, that's, again, objective. Um, but there is still so many, just like, he's such a dramatic and aggressive, like, peaks and valleys hitter at the moment. Um, we need a, a lick of consistency. And that just hasn't really happened all year. Kerry Carpenter's on base streak finally ends. His OPS is down to 881 after this one. It's just like everybody is just laboring at the same time. Matt Veerling one for four. Zach McKinstry. The the bright spot offensively. Oh, Carson Kelly had two hits in this game. Good for him. I I dogged on him yesterday. Glad he turned it around. I would love Car and like people keep getting this twisted. I would love nothing less than for Carson Kelly to be the good enough to prove that he should be the the second catcher on the team next year because that he would he would have to perform in the last month of the season to have the team exercise their team option for him. Um I, I would love that. I, I just like I'm not holding my breath, that's all. Um Javi made a fool of himself again. That's really not anything new. OPS is almost below 580 now. We're we're approach he's at 581. We're approaching under 580. Parker Meadows three hit ball game, two RBIs, the only two runs they score clutch single up the middle he's just like his approach is very like he is not over swinging and and that's so great to see a dude this early in his major league career just like you see I mean heck even when like when Riley Green takes hats hacks like if he swings and misses at a ball his helmet will fly off his head like Parker Meadows mechanics and, and his swing is is um it, it's just very fluid and smooth and it, it can be a little stiff and that's a concern that some people have had and we'll see what adjustments he makes throughout his major league career. People, you know, make adjustments all the time. We'll see. But so far early on, it's just, it's, it's very, like he, he's not swinging out of his shoes at anything. And like he has a, a decently high strikeout rate. And that's something that we've talked about since the call up happened. We've talked about that in the minors really since I took over this show, as far as Meadows goes. Um, but he's producing a lot. And, and he's just not trying to do too much. It's a very, very simple, just short swing, bat to ball, not trying to hit the ball 400 feet. He has the speed where if he's just putting the ball in play, he's going to wreak havoc and make stuff ha happen. Um, and, and I've just, I've loved his approach at the plate so far. I absolutely love it. I, I think it's a very professional and mature approach for a dude who's been in the majors for a week. Um, and, and then we obviously know what he can do on the base paths. He can absolutely fly. But this dude has the potential to be a legitimate plus-plus defensive center fielder. Um, like, he doesn't even need to hit, cr like, crazy high peaks offensively for him to be an unbelievably valuable player to a team and be, like, a two- or even three-plus win player as far as war goes with how good of a defender he's going to be in center field. So, um, high floor for Parker Meadows. We, we know recently we've been talking a lot about floors and ceilings, as I tend to do. Parker Meadows... 
The ceiling, we can argue forever. The floor is objectively high because even if he doesn't, even if he's a, a below league average hitter, he's going to run into one every once in a while, and he's going to give you speed on the base paths and a great defensive center field. And so, um, and like, to be honest with you, Parker Meadows saved this homestand from being absolutely atrocious. Like, think about it. If not for Parker Meadows, we shut out this game and we get shut out on, on last Friday's game and the walk-off home happens and, and we've lost, we've already lost four straight without that walk-off. It would have been. Because we lost the last game in the Chicago series too. One, two, three, four, five. So it would have been like five or six games in a row we would have lost. He has single-handedly prevented this from being like the most embarrassing homestand ever. And even with him, it's still been really embarrassing. <laughs> so shout out Parker Meadows. Ray of sunshine in a bad week of Tigers baseball. Uh, perspective's important though. Still, bad week. Okay, bad Bad week in August for a team that's has been on a playoff contention for months now and still is nothing's really changed big picture wise. So um, let's talk about Tarek Skubal and then the bullpen. We'll do that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at Margs. This episode is brought to you by Margs sparkling margaritas. Y'all know I love Margs. Uh, they are a great replacement to the typical white claws and high noons of the world. And they're refreshing, ready to drink sparkling margaritas. And they've officially become my go-to cocktail they're crafted with real Blanco tequila. They're clean, crisp, and they genuinely taste so good. They've got five unique flavors. There's something for everyone to enjoy. I drink these after work when I'm watching a game on the weekends, hanging out with friends. I've been packing my cooler with these all summer and will continue to do so into the fall because I think they're going to be the perfect tailgate drink this fall as well. So visit sipmargs.com to find a retailer near you. That's S-I-P-M-A-R-G-S.com to find a retailer near you. Must be 21 and over to enjoy. Please drink responsibly all right everybody welcome back here third and final segment here locked on tigers appreciate y'all for tuning in uh Tarek scuba in this outing weird outing and the reason why is because i, I actually thought he was good Tarek scuba does not give up home runs uh traditionally uh he, i'm pretty sure he hadn't given up a homer since last year and like obviously he was hurt for uh, a large majority of that, but he hadn't given, I don't think he had given up a homer since coming back from the injured list. I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, and he, he just like traditionally uh, over the last, well, two years that he's been healthy. He, that's not really been a big area of concern when he first got called up, there was a little blip there, but lately he has not given up any homers. And uh, so two solo shots, uh, only two earned runs against him in this ball game as the Tigers continue to just go through it defensively uh, for a team that like I, I sung the praises of at the middle of this point in the season, maybe maybe a little earlier, maybe it was like June. We talked about how they were surprising people and were better defensively than we initially thought the, this August. I mean, goodness, this has been a abysmal and honestly pathetic product defensively as a unit. Um, so that's a whole different thing, but um, two earned runs against just the two solo homers, nine strikeouts in six innings, only four hits. So like only, you know, if it, again, if it just wasn't for the fact that two of those four hits were long balls, two walks as well in six innings, like this is a quality start with nine strikeouts. Like this is, they're very far from like some awful, terrible performance. It's just, um, you know, I, he tried to, ambush a couple of hitters uh there was the first home run he gave up i didn't like that pitch call at all uh, i believe it was a full count if i'm remembering right and he had really given him the kitchen sink um I, I just think in today's day and age of baseball a fastball up and in on a full count is just far too predictable and uh it, it led to obviously the home run hindsight's 2020 20. i know i can say that now but um i, I didn't like it at the time i didn't you know please do not throw a fastball here and he did i thought the changeup was effective in this outing as well thought it looked really, really sharp. Um, but overall, again, not going to complain too terribly much. The offense did him no favors. He gets the loss in this game. More times than not, two run runs in six innings is going to put your team in a pretty decent position to win. But the Detroit Tigers offense is not a normal offense. So here we are. Um, yeah, you know, command was pretty solid. Uh, again, like the, even the home runs he gave up, I just thought it was – it was bad sequencing. I didn't think it was bad command. I didn't think it was, it was, you know, uh, the pitch, the stuff is always great. That's never a concern with school, but I just thought it was 
Um, I, I didn't agree with the pitches that he threw uh, in those instances. And that's not even 100% on him. So, um, yeah, I thought this was a, a sharp outing. Even if the final line isn't going to be the prettiest thing in the world, he continues to, to impress. Uh, and 3.93 ERA on the season, back to sub four. Good to see there. Yeah, I, I, I liked what I saw at Tarek. I, I didn't think that this was a bad outing at all. Uh, the bullpen, Will Vest, give that was the best I've seen Will Vest since before he got hurt. Um, I, we, we've talked a lot about on this show how he has just really struggled since coming back from injury. This was easily the best he's looked. The fastball had life to it. He was getting people to chase. Beautiful. Finally, thank goodness. Because um, uh, when Will Vest is on, he can be a pretty effective pitcher. And then Garrett Hill goes two innings, one earned run, gives up a home run himself, uh, one walk and two hits. Uh, sure, uh, Garrett Hill got gets recalled before the game. Him and Joey Wentz both going to be on the roster. Um, Garrett Hill obviously will be a reliever. Uh, Joey Wentz will start, I believe it's today's game. It's Wednesday's game, I believe. Joe, or well, they said he might just be like the the piggyback off the opener as well, like they did in Miami that one time. But he will get a bulk of the innings is the plan at a minimum, whether that's a starter uh, or, or, you know, if an opener is used, whatever. And then Garrett Hill, I don't have anything against Garrett Hill. I, I was much higher on Garrett Hill eight months ago than I am now. Uh, th this dude just has yet to prove that he can consistently find the strike zone, really in any capacity. Uh, but like he, he has a sinker that when it's in the strike zone, can be a good pitch. We saw it in spring training. We saw it early in the season, but just like so unbelievably inconsistent uh, what, when it just comes to putting the ball anywhere near the strike zone. Um, I mean, he has a not, an ERA over nine at the major league level this season. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think Garrett Hill's like going to be a starter probably for the Tigers ever again. And uh, if he is to be a reliever at some point, it's not without a massive adjustment being made. But uh, he's here now. Fill in uh, Andrew Vasquez gets put on the 15-day IL. So, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I think some people were kind of expecting him to get DFA'd more than anything else, but, uh, they're going to put him on the injured list, which means he'll be here for at least another 15 days. And then they have a decision to make, I guess maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe Sousa, like when Vasquez comes back from his injury in 15 days, if he's doing really well in AAA, maybe they choose him over Vasquez for the last three weeks of the season. We're splitting hairs over like two like well below league average lefty relievers. I'm I'm <laughs> just tired of it. I I really and like yeah, we'll talk about that a lot more in the off season. But um, it's just it's very weird to just see this team constantly add like like I don't want to say objectively because that that sounds too harsh to the to the players as individuals. But like they are adding consistently players that are not major league talent in 2023 just like constantly and it's just like i i would rather one of the prospects got a look in the last month of the season sawyer gibson long got a look if you wanted to be a pitcher then like continue to just add like 4a at best depth arms i i, I really would at this point <laughs> Um, that's it for the ball game. Uh, again, this, this offense just, this, it's not good. Let's talk about September call-ups. Um, September's right around the corner for September call-ups. Uh, it's no longer the days of 15 players getting added to your roster. It's now only two. So rosters will expand from 26 to 28. And with that, there are some decisions to be made. It sounds like all signs are pointing to the Tigers adding a bat and an arm uh, to that. So one of one, or one of one, one and one uh, for the two spots that will open up. Um, I Every day that goes by, I think it's going to be like really anticlimactic. And it's going to be uh, like Ryan Kreidler. I, I, I would, the thing is, I'll get on my soapbox for a second. If it if it's Ryan Kreider, I'm not mad. I want to see Ryan Kreider at the major league level too. I do. I, I think he has more to prove. We haven't gotten a legitimate look at him. Um, even if he doesn't end up being good, I, I I still like that's still a question mark to me. I want to know that he's not going to be good. But the problem is 
you're going to, like, if it is Kreidler, you're going to call him up and then, or like, oh my goodness, if it's Nick Maton, I, I think the fan base might lose it. And like, it, it's understandable, right? Like if it's just Maton and like Trey Wingenter. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't even want to put that out into the world. What if it is? What if it's just Nick Maton and Trey Wingenter, man? That's just, that's so pointless. That's so pointless. Like, th there has to be an understanding of how pointless that is. You, you have expendable players on the 40-man. You have the ability to put Colt Keith or Justin Henry Malloy on the 40-man roster. You have so many expendable players, and I'm not calling them expendable because of, like, a, a personal, like, attack against them, but, like, there are players that objectively you know will not be on this roster next year. There are so many, so many. What are we doing? Like, there's just, there's no point. So, like, I, I, if it's if it's Winsteel Perez, awesome. I, I'm, I'm about it. It's not Malloy and it's not Keith. And, like, so that's going to disappoint some people. Winsteel Perez is a versatile defender that has been crushing the ball in AAA, and he's on the 40, man. It's easier. I get it. I can understand the logic behind that, at least. Winsu Perez should be auditioning for a role next season. He has earned that. I, I just, I'm, I, I cannot express how disappointing and upset I'm going to be if it's just, if it's just Winginter and, and really Mayton. Like, I, I, and uh, I don't want to go down the Mayton rabbit hole right now, but like, Wing and Tura, I wouldn't even be like that upset about that in a vacuum. Like we haven't really gotten to see him do terribly much. I would rather Sawyer Gibson long, but like uh, if you want more of a look at Trey Wing and Tura, then fine. <laughs> Nick Mayton being the reason that Winsteel Perez, who has an OPS over a thousand, wouldn't get a spot. Now, I, I'm getting worked up about something that might not even happen, but like the fact that th the reason why is because we've seen it all season. We've seen a refusal to bring up anybody ever. Like I, I just, I, at, on a, on a base level, I just inherently disagree with that being how player development works. I didn't even plan on like having this conversation. This is not what I meant to bring up when I put September call-ups on here, but like players can continue to develop and improve at the major league level. They don't have to be their peak. like They're not going to be. They have to take lumps at the major league level and adjust to the major league level. You can't just keep somebody in the minors until they're 30 and then like call them up. And like, obviously the 30, that's an exaggeration, but like, hoping I'm articulating my point. I'm not just speaking gibberish into a microphone right now. Like I, I just, I, I want someone to get an opportunity. And, and my point with Kreider originally was, if it's Kreider, that's fine. I want to see Ryan Kreider too, but like, why not do more? That's my point. Why not use the extra roster spot, bring up Winsteel Perez, then also call up Ryan Kreider and make it at the expense of, I don't know, anyone. Literally anyone. Zach Short, not a long-term piece of this team. Love the dude to death. That that could be a choice. A Andy Abanez ha has unfortunately been one of this team's better hitters lately. Still is not a long-term piece to this team. Wouldn't care. Sure. Um, Zach McKinstry, not a long-term option. I think he's going to be here next year. That's a different conversation, though. But, like, not a, like a long-term, long-term piece. But you can just go down the list. There's so – there's like, you, you have the ability to give more than just, like, one person an audition. And, like, that's why – Man, I, I was going to have a relatively shorter show, and then I just completely just spewed for like eight minutes at the end here. But it's just – it's frustrating to me that like there's a, a non-zero possibility that it's just like Mayton again, and we just sit on our hands and watch the same thing we've been watching all year. And like if you would have told me going into the season that Justin Henry Malloy would not record a single at-bat at the major league level, I would have called you I, – well, I probably would have been upset and said there's no way that that's true. And like every day that goes by, I think that that's more and more likely. I don't think Cold Key is going to call up this year. I'll just put it out there right now. I'd love to be wrong. I'd love nothing more than to be wrong. 
I, I'm very convinced that Cole Keith's not seeing the major league field this year. Um, and Malloy, while I think there's a little bit more of a chance, every day that goes by, I become less convinced of that too. And like, yeah, I think I've said my piece. I wanted to end on like a little more of a positive note and I spiraled. So that didn't happen. Um, but uh, still, uh, the, the possibility is out there. I, again, I got, I just got upset over a bunch of scenarios that haven't happened yet. Nick Maton is not the person that got recalled. That announcement has not been made. Uh, I'm just, I'm getting mad in advance for something that may not even happen. So that's my own fault. I'm not trying to get everybody worked up for no reason. Um, but it, it's just, it's one of those things where you, you give someone a chance, Ple- uh, even if it's not Malloy or Keith, bring Winsiel Perez to the major leagues, switch hitter, versatile defender, crushing triple a, that should be a no brainer. It's just that you can do a lot more than just one person when the rosters expand. There's so many players that won't be here next year and you know, they won't be here next year. So give more than just one person a chance in September. That's what it's for. You're 14 games under 500, dude. All right. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every day. Appreciate y'all for tuning in. Um, Thank you for putting up with me. And we will be back tomorrow. Recapping game three. Sounds like, again, Joey Wentz going to get a bulk of the work in game three, whether that's an opener or not. And then Matt Manning will start Thursday uh, for game four. Um, Garrett Cole on the bump for Wednesday's game. So, yeah. It's kind of terrifying. Not really hold my breath for a win here. But also, like, it's baseball. So, like, we'll lose three of four, and the one game we win will be Garrett Cole because baseball. Okay, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll talk about that when it happens. Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all then, baby. Go Tigers.